Hello and welcome back to the Client Blue Podcast, sponsored by NordVPN. All the information you need for Nord is in the description down below. I'm your host, Dan Rowlandson, joined by John Townley after England's bitterly disappointing Euro 2024 final last night. John, are you over it? Are you disappointed? Are you gutted? How do you feel? Um, yeah, disappointed. I don't know, feeling of like what could have been. Um, I felt like the stars were aligning for England, to be fair, as the tournament went on because we had the, the Duke Bellingham goal that, you know, that's pretty miraculous. And then penalty shootout, then obviously Ollie Watkins come off, comes off the bench and scores and we started to play a little bit better. I don't actually think we played too bad yesterday, um, but mm. yeah, just two really bad goals. You can't, you can't um, not be up for the start of the second half of a major tournament final like we weren't. And then um, Carl Walker's got to take a ball and man when Kukurev puts the ball across the box. I don't know why he was hesitating and his positioning was mm. dreadful anyway. Stones yeah. square, ball watching. <laughs> like it's, it's a dreadful goal to concede so late in a final, but... Um, yeah, that's what's frustrating because it was in our hands when Cole Palmer scored. No Rodri, no Morata on the pitch either. Um, so, yeah, really frustrating. But yeah, it's, for- I'm kind of over it already, to be honest. Villa's back on Wednesday, aren't they? So. Yeah, Villa back in action against Warsaw. First pre-season game uh, this Wednesday evening. I'm, the way I feel about England, we've said a million times on the podcast before about club over country and all those kind of things. And I'm not going to go as far as we t- touched on I don't know, last week or the week before about like, oh, I'd rather win a corner against Warsaw than win the tournament. I'm not saying that. But the way I know how I feel about England is that if it was Villa had just lost the League Cup final last night, I'll be yeah. gutted. I'll be devastated for for a long time. I'm still annoyed about what happened to, in 2010, 14 years ago. For England, it's like, that was a real shame. Anyway, when does Una Emery's football come back? Like I'm, I'm really quite over it already, to be honest. Some people, this will hurt them for a long time, whereas I'm just, that's just not me. Uh, so we're here to talk about Aston Villa. We're here to answer your questions on all things Aston Villa. We'll dive straight into it, John, from Sai, who says, my question is, if we're selling Duran and Archer and pro- probably Moose the RB, who will we bring in as a striker? As I have no idea who. Sticking with the Euros the- theme, he says Fulkrug maybe. Uh, or will we play Rogers up top like he does for England under 21s? We need an out and out number nine, a centre forward that would replace Watkins if he can't play or a player who can make an impact. Uh, John Duran, you know, has certain limitations and flaws but still scored five Premier League goals. Obviously, the one against Palace wins Villa. I mean, a point, but then um, Villa obviously go on to win the game. Wins a point against Liverpool as well through two of his own goals. So um, Villa need to replace that impact, I I think. Uh, If we sign someone that's kind of like for like, I mean, if it's like for like for Watkins, then we're signing a good player, right? But in in style, I think we need, I know we're saying it's different profiles. We need different... Uh, ways of beating teams. There'll be games next season where we are being frustrated, like we were against Sheffield United or um, Palace, uh, you know, other matches as well. And we'll need something off the bench to spark us back into life. Um, even like, you know, Zaniola, for example, scoring that goal against Sheffield United, every point counts as we found out last season. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's imperative that we have different options for me. Um, so if Duran goes, which we expect him to, then I think we need to be buying a player who uh, can put themselves about and definitely someone like Fulkrug I'd be absolutely for. But Villa's transfer policy, I'd I'd be surprised if they sign a striker who's um, getting on in their career. I think it's more likely to be someone that's uh, younger. I know we'll probably do a video at some point, Dan, kind of outlining who we would go for. Um, we obviously did that last season, uh, the kind of £150 million budget or whatever it was. I don't think... I can't remember now if we had any strikes in our um, respective teams, but... I already know the striker I'd go for, but I guess I'll keep that a secret. (laughs) Um, Yeah, we definitely need another option for me. I mean, Max Bayer, for example, I think would be a really good addition because Mm. he actually do a bit more than just play as a centre-forward. He wouldn't just be a sub and he has the right um, physical attributes. But um, yeah, I'd be surprised if it was a situation where we'd buy someone who's getting on and I don't think Morgan Rogers would all of a sudden just be used as kind of a second striker. Um, pretty confident Emery would want to get someone else in. Mm, I think there'll be times where he does play that role, but I don't think the plan will be for him to be that from the start of the season and we sign nobody else. We're kind of venturing into other topics of discussion here for future episodes. And I don't want to be like, oh, we're not going to answer that now because we'll do it another time. But we are going to film another episode about the transfer state of play, if you like, that DRB, Duran, 
those kind of moving on, if they are to move on, opens up possibilities for Villa to manoeuvre in the transfer market with funds to play with. And I don't want that. That's a conversation that is 20 minutes, 30 minutes long. And we're on question one here. So we are going to save that for, for another time. Hayden says, when do we expect the international players to return? First of all, John, do we know the date? Because obviously players are back now, but Larks and McGee and Tielemans and Nana, when he eventually signs, are allowed an extra break because of their Euros involvement, Ollie Watkins concert. And also as a secondary point here for myself, can we have a try and have a guess at starting 11 for Warsaw? Oh, Who is available? Yeah, that would be um, something. I mean, I'll, I'll try to answer the first bit. I, I don't know exactly when uh, players are going to be coming back, but I'd hazard a guess that the likes of McGinn, uh, Tielemans, I mean, Onana's finishing his holiday and should be having his medical soon and then we'll presumably go straight into pre-season. Um, that I'd have thought would be this week at some point. Um, I don't think any of them will be involved for Walsall at all. Um, I don't know about uh, the game against Spartak Trinova as well. If not, then it'll be the week after. I presume all the players will be available to fly to America, which I guess would be mid next week. Again, don't know for certain. And what I would say is that they will be fully fit, like Onana is fit. Uh, Watkins, all of those players obviously played throughout the summer, so they don't need to load or anything in preseason. Mm. They're ready, but tactical ideas, getting used to new teammates. That's re- that's fifty percent of why preseason is so important. So um, yeah, you'd like to think that they'd all be in America for as long as possible. Again, don't know a date, but um, yeah, I-, I guess Martinez has a break now. Watkins, console, all those guys have a break. Matt's and I guess. I mean, I think he's gone back on holiday because he only had a short one because he was called up for the uh, Holland squad. But I don't know if, whether he'll come back for um, when the Belgian players do as well. We'll wait and see. But yeah, I, I'm sure Emery has, um, has it in his mind that most of those American matches, he'll have a full strength yeah. squad as such. Let's try and pick an 11 then just for the sake of fun. Um, we've seen some players back at Bodymore. Bailey, Diaby is there. Uh, Baron Chia is there. Pau Torres, uh, Diego Carlos. Martinez won't be there. John McGinn won't be there. Watkins, Conser. What kind of 11 are we looking at here? Is this one where you go, it's just a squad to put put some players together? Like Matty Cash is at Bodymore, but is this a game for Kessler Hayden? Olsen is there, but is it a game for one of the other goalkeepers? Is it that, is it that kind of level, do you think? Yeah, I presume that it'll just be two 11s in the 45. Mm. Like two different 11s, sorry, pretty much. Uh, Centre-backs is a difficult one. You've obviously got Carlos, Pau, um, no Conser, Mings, I don't think will be ready yet. I don't know, Josh Feeney, I suppose. Um, player who will probably be heading out on loan shortly. Um, he'll probably play because we're lacking options there. Left backs uh, is separate. Dean Moreno are both there. Yeah, Dean Moreno are both there, aren't they? Yeah. Revan played quite a lot in pre season, if I remember rightly, last year. Um, maybe he gets another chance. I don't know. But yeah, it's very hard to pick an 11, to be fair, because there's so much. Uh, yeah, there's also a lot of youngsters as well. Um, also, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> Yeah, exactly that. But it is always nice just to see Villa back. And um, yeah, it's also, I always find it weird because it always feels really soon, even though it doesn't. But I know when I watch Villa on Wednesday night, I'm going to be like, bloody hell, did I even like have that? Do you know the what I mean? Euros, the Euros disrupt that, doesn't it? If there'd been absolutely no football since the last game of the season, it'd feel different. The Euros just feels like there's been no break at all. Yeah, yeah. That is true, yeah. Let's move on. Um, from Koala Tov Mocktail, which is one of the greatest oh, names I've seen as a, as a Twitter, Twitter username. They say, we've gone from Emery saying there'll be two or three new signings to possibly as many as 10. <laughs> they won't all fit in the squad, so there will be outgoings. Either way, the 11 will look very different. Is this upheaval going to disrupt our early season progress? And we've kind of touched on that before, haven't we, about is it too many signings and all that kind of stuff and how will they fit together? I don't think that really is something to be hugely concerned about just on the point there from koala tov mocktail the 11 will look very different i don't think the starting 11 will be that different to what we saw at the back end of last season but i think the options that we have now to choose from and what variation of the 11 looks like i think that could be different i think you're probably looking at about four changes to the starting 11 so it's an amount um left back so, so what is that let's so matson matson or nana nana because we're going off the first day, I think Barkley will probably play. Yeah, oh, play. yeah, yeah. Um, and then possibly a centre back as well, or right back, you know, eight end of the defender, I think. Mm. Um, so that would be kind of a guess, but it's not like huge upheaval if they have enough pre season games. I'm not too worried about that. But what was the start of the question from Koala? Like Emery saying two or three, and yes. then it's going to be as many as 10. 
Yeah, that, that makes me laugh because I, I remember the press conference where he said it and I was like, oh, okay, you know. <laughs> and it just hasn't proved to be that way at all because I think in the first couple of weeks of the window, we signed like five players. <laughs> so it already threw that out of the water. So, um, yeah, what Emery did say is we have to be intelligent. And he did say that we have to balance our FFP at the start, um, mm. which basically, I mean, when we were, I mean, kind of, I think everyone was expecting to sell players. And, um, yeah, speaking to people within Villa, it was very much a case of, again, Villa do need to make changes before the start of the window, which basically meant a big player was going to go. So I think we all expected Louise in the end because yeah. I mean, everyone did the working out on that, didn't they? Um, and I think we're in a really good place now. But yeah, my concern, if I had one, would be what Koala says there uh, about the kind of the volume of change. Um <laughs> Again, I think I've mentioned previously, though, whenever I've looked at what Monchi's done in previous windows, he's always bought a lot of players and sold mm -hmm. a lot of players. I don't know if that's just a European thing. I've no idea. Um, but that's certainly happening at Villa now. And yeah, whenever he said two or three, or I don't know if he said two or three, but I think he said not many. I think he said that we're not planning to bring in many players. Um, yeah. The only other thing I'd say is that we are full up in the squad now. So uh, we have maxed out. If we're going to buy players, we have to sell them. Not yeah. because of financial reasons or kind of in part but the main thing is that we <laughs> whiffle there's yeah. no no space yeah part of the business that we're seeing is replacing others as well isn't it that if duran goes we have to sign another forward if we get a great offer from saudi for musa diaby we have to sign somebody else like this isn't just fill a bloat in the squad for the sake of it do you think on diaby or is that just an example what, what are you asking me john as in you say obviously um duran going we need to buy another player of course if diaby yeah. goes you think we need to replace diaby yeah. Do you? After Philly Jane as well? Oh, I think so, yeah. It depends who the Duran signing is, I suppose, the Duran replacement. I don't think we do. I don't know if this is treading on another video we might be doing, but I just... I Philly Jane has been given assurances that he that he's going to be playing football. And yeah, well, the Philly Jane one's interesting. Like I said, we are going to do this as a separate one, but you know, last summer, the the um, noise around Philly Jane was that Emery wanted him to stay. Um but he wanted to go for game time. My initial reaction at the idea of activating a matching clause to bring him back and all this kind of thing was like, well, if we couldn't give him game time last year, surely we can give him even less this year because we are better now. We're in the Champions League, etc. Morgan Rogers exists. Uh, Bailey had a great season. Diaby is there. If Diaby is not to be there, that opens up more game time for Philogene and he obviously has assurances this time around that he is going to get game time, otherwise he would not be coming back here. That's plainly obvious. Yeah. But I just think from a, I'm not saying Philogene's a bad player because he isn't, but from a quality perspective, if we sign Musa Diaby for 40 odd 50 million and then sell him for 50 odd 60, surely you need to bring in another big signing as well? I don't think we can. Somewhere. I, we, we don't have the space for a start. If you buy it, another player after DRB we, we, we have no at the moment if you look at it we've just signed or we're going to sign on Arna and we're not selling anyone and now we're going to bring in Philogene and not selling anyone if that's the case we have too many players then for the Champions League we have to drop about three players mm -hmm. so you know in that squad building video we did and we and we I think we put Gallagher as like a place marker of new midfielder um then we were looking at I think one player that we have to get rid of, which we thought would be maybe a left back like Moreno or uh, even Dean potentially. I think we were one over uh, mm. or Junior, and now it's going to have to be another one. That's going to be really tough. So I, I just can't see a world where Philogene comes back to Villa because he didn't have to, by the way. Obviously, he had to um, accept a proposal from someone and he chose us. I, I don't see why he would come back to us if something hasn't changed or might change so you you'd say the scenario that dr believes for say 60 million euros is is what has been touted and philogene is his replacement for 13 million pounds and we basically bank that 40 50 excess if you like for next season's accounts yeah and obviously we've just signed onana as well which kind of balances oh, yeah, that. Of course, yeah. So, i mean that in my head appears likely Again, that's not inside information or anything. That just appears likely to me. Obviously, again, we know there's interest, etc. Um, I don't know if anything's going to actually materialise, but I'd be shocked if it didn't, in a way, because the Philogene stuff, is that's the big clue. We'll move on, John, because we are going to do more on Philogene, DRB and Duran in a future episode, probably this week. Um, so let's move on to Lee, who says, what are the existing cliques in the squad and how will the new players settle into that? I so saw somebody respond something like, well, Douglas Ruiz is out of the South American group, so 
and Joe Barron yeah, comes in and fills his role. <laughs> it's like they'll, they'll be friends now with a different group, which is quite funny. Yeah, I, I don't see. I, I think we mentioned at the back in the last season about how um, how kind of open the dressing room feels because of yeah. the leaders we have in the squad. Emmy Martinez is like it's, it's mental. Just won another Copa America, four titles in three years. Like he, yeah. the best leader you could possibly have, and um, yeah, John McGinn as well um, for. It's hard to kind of explain or put into words kind of what what he is to Villa um, and how he kind of immerses himself within the club. And we only see snippets of that from uh, from the outside as fans. Um, just little jokes and stuff that he, that he'll be saying on camera and you're thinking that it must be very uh, kind of warm and welcoming again uh, for the dressing room. I mean, stuff like that, I'm, you know, I have no issues with or no um, concerns, shall I say. Uh, Illing Jr. is obviously English, so he'll settle fine i think he really is straight away um matson obviously speaks very good english he's played in england for a long time onana has played in england for a long time speaks five languages and Do they? wow impressive yeah very fluent in english as well or oh, he, he is um he is fluent so those are three players barkley <laughs> has been villa previously so knows mcginn very well knows a couple of the players consum uh, mings and then i've missed someone out i think philogene obviously <laughs> was at villa <laughs> And Dobbins is the other one, but I think he'll go out on loan. Yeah, yeah, and he's a younger player. Um, has played previously with some of our younger players. We'll know Onana, so even if he does stay, that's there. Um, I'm sure I've missed another player. Did you mention Enzo? Uh, Enzo, that was the other one, yeah. Um, as you said, we have a lot of South Americans in the team. And noticing on the um, videos, Villa TV videos, pretty sure they're speaking Spanish to him as well, like the coaches who are Spanish. So, again kind of perfect scenario there. So I don't kind of see any issues that can crop up here. Mm. So I'm happy with all of that. Yeah, no concerns. Yeah, okay. Now, next question. You mentioned McGinn here. So you're not going to like this next question uh, right. from Matt, who says, will John McGinn be first choice by Christmas? With Bailey and Ramsey or Rogers first choice wide, I think he might start behind the striker, which we've seen at times. But is Rogers, Buendia, or potentially a new signing, brackets, Olmo, please, which I thought was funny, and I a better bet in that position. I love John McGinn, but I do wonder. John McGinn starts every game when fit, doesn't he, I think? Yeah. I struggle. I struggle with these questions a little bit because when does John McGinn like have a poor game? Like very well, he does. He, yeah, he's going to have poor games, and that is going to happen. It's but Yeah. He is I don't know. I just feel like quite... play anywhere required. I just feel like he's quite. Um, I don't know. Like weirdly, he's become like a bit of a. Now that we're progressing so much, which is largely in part to John McGinn's performances and leadership, I feel like some fan. And again, game of opinions, right? And this isn't someone saying that John McGinn isn't uh, the player that he is. He's just saying that because of competition, which I, you know, I understand. But he's still our captain. I can picture in it almost every game. Him doing something that we wouldn't have otherwise, whether it's driving at defence, turning away, winning a foul, breaking up play, something like that. Like that's invaluable. And, and you know, another point, your point you're trying to say is what I've seen as well, where people like do their their best 11s on Twitter and stuff, and McGinn's oh, either exactly. not not in the team or he's been sold. And it's like if he's fit, he's playing every single game. Yeah, it, it, again, uh, if we're going off last season, we'll be playing in that role, that advanced midfield role. That's his best position for me. Um, and there's a few players like him in the Premier League and Premier League players always say that John McGinn's like a nightmare to play against because of how yeah. he can roll you. His low centre of gravity is so hard to knock off the ball. Um, yeah, like I understand the question of increased competition, etc. But I think that goes for everyone and every player in the team. You've now got Ramsey and uh, Rodgers and that's kind of, you know, this time, uh, maybe not last season or last summer, shall I say, we were all thinking, okay, well, Ramsey is now going to make that step up. And this isn't a criticism, by the way, but no one expected that in a year's time, we're going to have a player very similar to him who's only played nine or 11 Premier League games. You know, there's loads of competition throughout the squad because of Emery's coaching and management. Um, McGinn is no different. There's always going to be competition. And Emery, what I like about this situation is he's always happy to pull McGinn off if he feels like Villa did something else. Bringing McGinn off isn't like a thing now of like, oh, he's brought McGinn off. He's the captain. Whereas previously, I think it might have been, but now it's like, okay, well, we have options and McGinn is happy with that, you know. Um, but I'd expect him to start every game if he's fit. If he's fit sorry, yeah. But that isn't uh, a worry of mine that McGinn will all of a sudden become like a backseat player. I, I don't, I just don't see that. I think he's a fantastic. We all know he's a fantastic player. But yeah, 
competition will increase, of course it will. I don't see a situation where he doesn't start every game next season. Oh, sorry, most games next season. And he's not one of the first team names on the team sheet. Yeah. If he's not, it's because he's either got injured and he's out of the team. And when he becomes fit again, he's kind of lost his place because whoever came in played very well. Or we've improved so dramatically that we've gone past John McGinn's level, who I think is a very, very good player, which yeah. will be a massive amount of improvement in, in one go. We look at the the Rams example of last year. I know that it's come down to injury, but if in your squad, if I could have offered you at, at one stage Ramsey or Rogers and like Dobbin and Philogene and were like you reserve player, if you like, you go, I'd take that. To have Rogers yeah. and Ramsey both competing for the same spot effectively is such strong depth that maybe in a year's time we're, we're talking about McGinn in a different way. But as of right now, you'd you'd have to say that he's going to be in there for sure. Let's talk about the, the midfield setup. Then. This is a question from Chris, who says, there was a lack of physicality in our midfield after Kamara got injured. Now we've added Barkley and Enzo while also adding Anana. But with Douglas Luiz gone, how do you set this midfield up? Can Kamara and Anana play together? If not, who is benched? Is it a centre midfield trio? I genuinely have no idea. Firstly, this is a problem that big clubs have and big yeah. teams have because we're kind of scrambling around thinking, oh, can they play together? Can this happen? We'll find out firstly, but secondly, there's obviously a plan. And again, like if someone has to miss out, they have to miss out. This is part of being part of a good team. Yeah. Um, you need a really strong bench players that can play in the 11 without the level dropping, basically. Um, what I would yeah, say. Like imagine, so, like imagine if Anana is on the bench and he's your kind of player that you see us bringing on to shore out a game, a filler ahead. You would much rather be in that position of bringing on a 50 million pound back up, quote-unquote, than Timmy Rabunum last year, going, well, he's a defensive midfielder with a, a, bit of, a bit of stature about him, bring him on. To be in that level of raised quality and raised um, profile makes every start in the game. They have to up the game as well because they know there's somebody breathing down their neck to come in and take their spot and keep that spot. And we often, as fans, think, well, that player can't be happy doing that role, sitting on the bench, but a club, a big club, a Champions League club, and they have to earn the right to get their place, as we saw with Tielemans last year. You know, where's he going to fit in? Yeah. Six months later, we're saying he's instrumental to how, how Emery wants to play. And things change, and I suppose that goes back to the previous question about McGinn that we're saying right now, well, he has to be in there. Well, six months down the line, maybe Anana, Kamara, and Enzo is the best midfield in the Premier League, and there's not a spot for John McGinn. Like, things change and things progress. Yeah. Um, but if players don't get in the start eleven, there's still a role for them. There's still a, uh, a case to be made that they can come in and change things. Yeah, precisely. Um, what I would say straight away is that Kamara will play every game when he's fit because he's one of the best holding midfielders in in the Premier League. Um, so that's one of the positions. Uh, Emery does like to play with that double pivot, so I think we're safe to kind of go off a two-man midfield to start with. So Kamara is one of those players. The question is, can Onana, or sorry, not can, but how does Onana play with him? Because we have bought him for £50 million, you know, possibly. I think it's a club record um, fee. He will be playing more often than not, of course, and Kamara will play every game. So those two will have to form a relationship somehow, whether it's with another player um, in a three, I, I don't know. Um, again, McGinn, Tielemans, for me, I'd want to see them more advanced. Barkley is a player that... Um, can do the advanced role, but I think has been brought in primarily to be the kind of deep line midfielder in a double pivot again. So the way I see it is you have two holding midf midfielders as, you know, kind of traditional sixes as such with Enzo and Kamara. That There's two there, so two players per position. In the one next to it, you've got uh, Barkley and you've also got kind of uh, Tielemans can do that and obviously Anana can do that, but I almost see Anana is a, a mix of both. So, yeah, um, and then McGinn for me is the advanced player. I don't really want to see McGinn in the double pivot. If he, of course, he can play there and play there to a very good level, but I like to see him with shackles off. Being that would be a midfield crisis, wouldn't it? If McGinn is starting as a double pivot player next season, it's that we've got a lot of injuries again. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what crisis. But... No, I mean like we've we've it's, like if, if you've yeah. got Kamara and Enzo, are you are you kind of number six and Anana and Barkley are your other side. If yeah. and and Tielemans can also play there. If it's yeah. then McGinn, well, like yeah. last last line of defence of like we want him staying further forward, don't we? But my question with the midfield now is, we haven't directly replaced Douglas Louise. I think Barkley is probably the closest thing to it from a technical point of view um we said for a long time probably two years ago that Douglas Louise was our best technical player uh and that was true 
Onana technically isn't at Louise's level. He offers a lot of other things that we definitely don't have in the squad. So this isn't me being negative. But my only question mark is how do Villa exert that control that we had in Louise? And again, we haven't just signed Onana because he because we think he can do that. We signed him for a different reason. Therefore, I think something's going to be changing in the team. How that looks exactly, we'll find out. But Emery will have a plan. Uh, I don't doubt that. But my only slight concern is that if Onana and Kamara are both on the pitch at the same time, which they will be, I'm sure, for a lot of matches, how exactly are we controlling things without a player or a profile like Louise? Um Again, we'll wait and see, and I'm not like under massive stress about that. We'll play in a different way or whatever, but I don't think we've got that profile of player exactly. Obviously, we have a Telemans who can do that. Um, so maybe that's kind of answered my question. But again, Onana and Kamara, I'm sure, are going to be playing a lot of games with each other. So, um, yeah, we'll see how it goes. But again, big club problems, right? This is uh, yeah. it's the beauty of being where we are now. And a lot of the things that we're talking about as pre-season <laughs> kicks off, we'll hopefully see a little bit more of by, well, a month, almost a month today is the start of the new season. So we will know more within 30 days about how Villa are going to line up. And it will be very interesting to see how they line up in that first, I don't know, five or six games of the season. Yeah. Obviously, because Kamara won't be available from the off. So that kind of almost solves an initial headache. A little bit like the Pau Torres-Mings thing of last year. Like, oh, how are they going to play together? And Mings, unfortunately, got injured for the season straight away. How's Anana and Kamara going to get on? Well, they won't have to till probably exactly. November. So we don't need to think about it for now, uh, which is probably part of the reason why we signed him. Next question from Sam, who says, Have Villa missed a trick not having a friendly in Argentina, or at least a game against an Argentinian side whilst in America? Is this a market we could capture? Pretty sure we've discussed this probably last year or, or the last Copper America, whenever that was about. We've got a trophy winning goalkeeper here who is regarded as a, a national hero. Leon, Lionel Messi seems to never stop talking about how good he is as a, as a goalkeeper. For Villa not to have tapped into that South American market as a whole, really, with, with Luis, Buendia, Diego Carlos, Emi Martinez. I'm um, sure I'm probably missing one or two. Coutinho, I suppose, uh, season's gone by, which not not quite worked out uh, as we thought. Something like a, a, a friendly against Boca Juniors or something like that to like basically go to um, to Argentina and sell Aston Villa shirts and be like, the guy that you lord as a hero for your national side, he plays for us, by the way, and like we're pretty good as well. Like, Do you want, do you want, to, come, do you want to come and support us at the same time? I, uh, I imagine if we lost. Um, well, true. But it yeah. feels like that is something we should be capitalising on, surely. Yeah, what I would say is I don't know for Argentina. I know for Brazil that their season has started. Like, it's obviously there. It's their, um, it's their winter now, basically. So mm. they play their league games at this point in the calendar. So our pre-season is their season. Uh, so that's why I was a bit, um, I was kind of questioning, are we going to do continue for six months until January? Cause their season, I think ends mm. on December the 20 something in Brazil. Um, I follow Palmeiras from very afar because my partner's dad supports them. So it's like, a, it's a massive thing. Um, in Brazil, uh, obviously their league as well. And it's, um, there's a lot kind of wrong with it at the same time. So, even things like their pitches are dreadful. <laughs> like I don't know how many injuries you'd pick up. It feels like a hazard to play on uh, the pitches when I watch um, matches and stuff. So, yeah, I don't know about the kind of the logistics of it, if I'm being honest, because we go to America first because it's a huge market and it's, you know, a great place to play your football, etc. But the training facilities are second to none. They're probably the best mm -hmm. in the world. Going to Argentina or Brazil, I, I'm not sure how that would work. Um the only other thing we could do is play in places like Miami again. Uh, we played, um, did we play Fulham, was it? <laughs> Which isn't particularly glamorous, but honestly, mate, it's crazy when the Villa coach pulled up outside the, I forgot what stadium it was now, which is really bad because I was there. The Florida, it was in Florida. Who is it? Who plays in Florida? Oh, God, no. Miami Dolphins. Really bad. What? what? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, it was a football team. Who was it? Who plays in Florida? I don't know. Tampa <laughs> Bay something. <laughs> Christ, Dan, no, MLS team. Who, were <laughs> Who was it? I was literally there. That's I'm really It was all like the FedEx stadium and stuff. No, but it was like, it was a specific, um, it was just for the club. Oh my God. Yeah, of course. Not what? Orlando, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. Oh dear. Um, Orlando yeah. Pirates. <laughs> <laughs> dear. Um, yeah, going to the Orlando stadium, the Villa coach pulls up and Honestly, the amount of fans that were obviously South American just to see Martinez and uh, I don't know if we had anyone else that was really of interest, but um, Argentinian fans anyway. 
yeah, they went crazy for him because it's like a huge thing for them, as you say, Dan. But yeah, the logistics of playing against Boca or River, again, I don't know when their season starts. I presume it's similar to the Brazil League because obviously they have the Copa Libertadores as well, which is intertwined and all sorts. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, I just don't know how it would work. I think Club America, their season is also starting, but we are playing them in a pre-season game uh, in America. So um, yeah, I'm sure it could happen somehow, but we'd have to do it in their home, right? And I don't know how it would work playing at... Um, the Bombonera or anything like that. So, uh, did I say that right? Probably not. <laughs> good, good effort. I think. Let's rewind a little bit. We were talking about the midfield setup. This uh, next question asks about defence, specifically right back from Nick. He says, "Give us your thoughts on the right back position." I really don't rate Ezri Konsa there. He seems out of his comfort zone. Um, but is Cash good enough to take us to the next level? Mm. I don't know whether I say. Conte was out of his comfort zone at right back. There was times there was games where I thought this is not the right solution, um, but giving us the chance to play basically three centre backs by Carlos Torres and Conte in some games certainly we saw the benefits of that. But it's not that Conte is not a good right back; it's just that he's not as good as a right back as he is a centre back. And I'd rather him play in the middle than than be pushed out to right back. Yeah. But as we know, move across, play, play three centre backs, etc. We've we've seen all that. Yeah. Is Cash good enough to take us to the next level is something I would query a little bit. He's obviously a good footballer and he, we've got to where we are with him playing for us, um, with Conte playing right back as well. Is Cash good enough to be a Champions League right back? I'm not so sure. I feel like we have maybe reached a bit of a level with him, a little bit of a cap. What I say straight away is that if we were to bring in another right back, Cash would have to go because, yeah. again, I'm going to go back to the whole whiff full up. Um, <laughs> cash has a price tag. Villa don't want to sell cash because I don't. I don't think it's as much as a problem as what people are making out. I, I think it's definitely somewhere we could pro you know, probably improve in an ideal world. But is it a problem that we have to look to be fixing when there are for me other things that are wrong mm. with the team? Not I say wrong again. A lot is right, but I don't think we want to make this. What I'm trying to say is I think we could probably make a bigger issue for ourselves by kind of messing with something that isn't completely broken, basically. Um, you can kind of apply the, the logic of left back to right back from last summer to this and to next even, that last year we kind of wondered whether Luca Dean might be on his way out because he's a high earner and there was interest. He obviously sticks around and Moreno is not the player that he was when he initially signed and Dean has a great season. So basically you kind of postpone your business at left back to this year where we've signed Matson and he's kind of your long-term plan for that position if you like you almost could maybe think the same of this year that cash there's potential interest from from AC Milan and price tags of 30 odd million if cash doesn't go this year and sticks around I'd back him to to play a role and, and be be important for us and rotate with with concert if that's still the way that we play and maybe you fix this problem next summer by signing your Ian Matheson of 2025 and focus on other areas of the pitch for now because right back is not a priority. Yeah, possibly so. And I just think Emery clearly wants to play with three defenders, which means that Conza will have to be playing right back. Therefore, for me, the situation that we have to be fixing is the centre-back issue. I, I'm not fully confident with Carlos. And again, we know that Villa will, will listen to offers if and when they drop. Um, he's 31, he has two years left, so this is the last time Villa can get any sort of reasonable fee for yeah. him. The centre-back for me, that's the key issue. I'd love us to sign Tadebo. I don't think that's going to be happening because Juventus uh, want him. It's going to be costing, I think, about £40 million or so. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'd rather spend money in that position than at right-back when Cash is still a Premier League footballer. Like He gets a lot of criticism and, um, yes, there's areas there where he can improve, but that goes to the same for most. Sorry, you can say that. Um, for most players in the team. I personally view Conza as our first choice right back now because we play with the three um, defenders and I know it's not ideal in some situations, but if we play Conza at centre-back, all of a sudden we don't play with three at the back unless you drop Kamara in there when he's... Um, mm -hmm. fit. That would be the only option, but then again, I'm still looking at the centre-backs and I think, well, I'd like to have uh, another one. Um so, yeah, for me, when it's not as cut and dry as we definitely need a new right back because we play in a certain way, which we which we don't, um, yeah, I don't think it's worth paying above 30, 40 million for a right back when I think we could probably use that money elsewhere better because mm. 
that right back, which is if we sign a player for the first team, they're going to be a top player, right? Can we tell them, yeah, you'll be starting every game? No, we can't because Conte will be playing right back in some games as well. It's definitely gone off last season. So, yeah, I just don't, I don't see it as like an urgent thing that has to be sorted, basically. Um, yeah, and I think Conte is definitely okay playing right back as well. And again, it might look a bit awkward at some points, but um, he's probably one of the best. Or sorry, definitely is one of the best, maybe the best uh, one-on-one defender in the Premier League. Like genuinely, that he's that good. So um, in most cases, I think we he's probably underrated in um, in a sense that when a, an attacker lines him up one v one on the wing, they rarely ever beat him. And I think that's probably in some you know, I don't know how to explain. It. it doesn't work against him, but because nothing really happens down that channel, you kind of forget that he's actually doing very well. Mm. I think that's kind of thing or the way that I look at it. Um, but again, yeah, another centre back for me is the uh, is what I would like, what I would like to see, rather than us spending big on another right back and then selling another player who's you know um, a key player in the dressing room, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We kind of want to limit, I think, the overturn of players as much as we can. I don't think it's imperative that we have to sell cash to bring in a right back who may only play or start twenty games next season, considering what we did last year with the three back centre backs. So yeah, I think. I think if you were playing a right back in the way that most right backs play these days and they're bombing forward and they're overlapping and they're putting balls into the box and getting a couple of goals here and there, when people say like, oh, we need a new right back, someone's like Frimpong from Bayer Leverkusen, who's basically a right winger. And if he was playing a right back in Villa system, as Conta plays it and he's sitting back, it's not, it's a waste of money. That's not what he's going to do. That's so if it was, the, yeah, exactly. But if Cash was that player who was always bombing forward, he played 38 games, but he's got three assists and his, his crossing's poor, whatever it is, and you go, well, that, we played that role, then yeah, selling him for 30 and getting Frimpong for 60, you go, okay, well, we've spent money, but that's what we need. That's what we that's what we play. Yeah. If we're going to play as we were last year, where the right back is basically a third centre half for, for 90% of the game, we don't need to spend big on a attacking fullback just yet. Maybe that's something that changes in the future. Yeah. Maybe it changes now. Who knows? We might pull out a sign out of nowhere. But the oh, likelihood right. is we, we we won't play. We won't play that. The penultimate question is from Smithy. It's a bit of a, a complaint, if anything. And I've not we've touched on a few th- few of these things before, and I, I don't know how much we can add to it now. Is this a complaint about us? Or... No, no, no. If it was about us, mate, it wouldn't be in the running order, would it? It'd just ignore all that kind of stuff. Can we do a video <laughs> on hate comments? I'd love to do that. I don't look at them myself, but... Sure we don't, I don't think we get enough to do a whole video for it. No. We're not about to, maybe we can introduce like a weekly segment in this episode, like Bad Take of the Week. If you want to like slag us off in the comments, if you if you want to get featured next week, you've got to slag us off, is what, <laughs> is what I'm saying, which is mental. Uh, some people will take that seriously now. Go, oh, that guy's got such a big head. Yeah, all right, I know. Okay, well, leave me alone. <laughs> anyway, it's not, a, it's not a complaint about the podcast, thankfully, because we don't get many of those. It's a complaint about Villa's off-the-pitch uh, status, I suppose, uh, from Smithy, who says, the Spartak game is in five days and there's been zero communication from the club regards tickets. The kit is always late and there's zero update from Villa and the relocation for displaced fans. The phone lines are, phone lines are constantly full. We're great on the pitch and awful off it. Let's do those in reverse. The displaced fans we've kind of touched on before, that was handled poorly and it still sounds like it's being handled poorly. The kit stuff, there was an update from Chris Heck maybe, I don't know, three weeks ago about the kit will be out after the Euros. We're now after the Euros. It should be some point this week or next. So <laughs> we're playing games soon. It has to happen at some point. But it being always late is something that Villa is labelled with a lot and it's true. I would love ours to come out at the, I don't know, some point during June, people go on holiday, they like to wear the new shirts abroad, all these different things, like tap into that market. People want them, start selling them. Yeah. But Chelsea's only came out today. Um, somebody else's came out yesterday. I think Brighton's came out today as well. Like, It's not massively unusual to come out like mid-July. That, like, that is a thing. If it was that we were playing on the 17th of August and the shirt came out on the 1st, it's like, well, that's late because we've had pre-season games. Like, I also don't want it to go too far the other way that we start playing in the the kit on the final game of the season. Oh, I don't I don't like that either. But like you know, the, the first week of June should be attainable. Yeah. What I will say about Adidas is obviously it was a uh, it's all been quite rushed because of the cancelled Castor deal. So this year is probably an outlier. I would expect us to be at sooner with the kit release next year because from a marketing point of view, getting it out earlier makes sense. This year, getting it out and throwing it out mid Euros probably didn't make sense anyway. So, how have I done it this year? I don't really have too many complaints with personally. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the Spartak game, no ticket communication when it's in five days. Yeah, that's bad. Yeah, I wasn't, uh, or, or I'm not aware of the Spartak situation. To be honest, I haven't seen it on Twitter either. Um, 
but I think there was a situation with Dortmund where, and I don't know if it's Dortmund's fault, to be fair, I'm not too sure, but I think they linked the page to the website and it kept crashing because it was the case of there was like a window or something where you had to make an account. And uh, yeah, it wasn't ideal. And people got tickets in the end. I don't know. Probably people didn't at some uh, for some as well because of uh, the issue there. So yeah, not ideal. Um, on the kits... Yeah, maybe this changes now. No one from uh, from now, sorry, because Heck is in charge. But you're right, Dan. This is kind of an exceptional year because we've had so much change. We've had a new sponsor, um, new kit supplier as well, cancelling of contracts. There's a lot going on there. Plus, it's a big thing to be with Adidas in our situation. Um, yeah. You know, we'll um, we'll find out, I suppose, or it will be confirmed uh, whether or not Villa are in the kind of elite group of teams. Um, this is much more than us just being part of a, you know, an Adidas uh, agreement when it's with like Fulham or Leicester or, mm. or um, you'd hope so anyway, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, um, it definitely is. Yeah. So it, it's bigger than just kind of having a template. Well, we know we haven't got a template kit. So that's my first point. Like it, it's, it's a much um, bigger process for Adidas to be doing what they're doing with us this summer than with other teams, especially because of the upheaval we've had. So yeah, hopefully in the years to come, we'll be one of the first teams and all of that stuff. I'll be honest, I don't care <laughs> about <laughs> the, the kids late. I don't really understand why it's an issue. Uh, yes, ideally you'd like to be playing in it for your first pre-season game and um, stuff like that and to see it. But kind of like you with the fixtures, it's going to come out before the start of the season. So what's the uh i, I don't really get the uh the kind of the issue I, don't know. I mean it will sell very well it will be one of our best sold kits of the last few years i think because it's adidas because people want the champions league badges on it it will sell well whether it comes out in june or august yeah, and there will also yeah. be a, a massive amount of people who will think 80 pounds is a lot i'll wait till january and i'll buy it for 50 or whatever when it comes down as happens every year as I will probably do at some stage as well um, kits are very expensive which is a, a different talking point but they'll yeah. sell well regardless so if, if it is I mean I've seen the, I've seen the £80 uh, I don't know if that's been confirmed or hasn't been confirmed yet but um, £80 is apparently the price uh, there's no way I'd be forking out 80 quid for a shirt I just I can't I'm tempted just because it's Adidas and there'll be other people in that camp as well. Yeah. It's Adidas, it's different, it's Champions League. Like If it's a nice design or whatever, if it's a terrible design, it will not sell as well. If it's okay, which I'm sure it will be, what I will say is it probably will be safe because the, the first um, kit of a new manufacturer for a club is usually pretty pretty standard. Like There won't be too much experimentation with any of the kits, I don't think, but next year's ones I would expect to be a level above even again, I think. It can't be as bad as Chelsea's kit, put it that way. And oh, well, so it up. it'll be, it'll be, it's going to be a nice kit. But yeah. um, Chelsea's kit is absolutely dreadful. Right, where are we? Final question then uh, from Hulberto, who says, "How many trophies would Unai Emery win if he was England manager? More than more than any manager of the last sixty years, I would say." Yeah, I, I mean, this kind of opens the debate of like, where do you stand with the England stuff? Of like, put it this way. I, I we should have won two Euros now. Uh, Do you think? Yeah, that's a fact. <laughs> I think we should have beaten Italy. I'm not so sure about we winning last night. Be. We should have won last night. Do you think? I think Spain yeah. were the best team throughout the tournament and the best team last night. But it was in our hands. When Cole Palmer scored that goal, it's ours to lose. And we lost it. So yeah. I'm not saying this before the game. Before the game was very much the case of like if we lose to Spain, so be it. They've been the best team, as you say. But that doesn't win your finals. And when they took Roger off, that was a stroke of luck we needed again. We had a lot of luck and you need that. We kind of relied on it, I think. But once we got back in the game and it was one all, you can't lose the game from there. Similar to the Italy match, like as soon as we won it up and it was um, relatively comfortable for a large part of the game, you, you just can't lose those matches. And uh, you the game. Uh, yesterday, I didn't put it on Southgate. Carl Walker has to clear quicker into the stands and we probably don't go on to the match. Uh, yesterday, I, I don't blame Southgate. I blame Southgate probably for the Italy game. And I, th I said at the time, it was time for him to go then. Kind mm -hmm. of like, oh, thank you for everything you've done. You've laid the foundations. Fantastic job. Now it's someone else's turn. We lost to France. Not Southgate's fault, really. We were probably a better team against France. But then this tournament, we rode our luck a lot. Um, yeah. But still got there. And if we won it, who cares? But we didn't win it. We're still 58 years in counting. So for me, it's time to... Uh, it's time for Southgate to go, but I want him to stay in the building. But a new manager needs to come in. Because ultimately, yeah, we've got to finals, we've got semi-finals, we've had some fantastic nights. 
but we've won nothing. So, yeah. and, and that's the point of why you qualify for tournaments. That's why we have three international breaks, four international breaks in the whole season to win something, and we don't. So, um, yeah, time for someone new. I don't want Unai Emery to be the England manager. <laughs> no, I was about to say, time for someone new. Unai Emery, no way. I don't know. Um, would Emery win competitions? Yeah, I don't doubt that. It, 100%, especially with the runs we've had. That's the key thing for me. If we came up against, as we did against France and we lost and we got knocked out straight away, that would have happened, I'm sure, if we played a Germany or something like that in previous rounds because we weren't ready. Um, in the final, we start, we, we kind of build, we built up that momentum. So that's why we were competitive against Spain. If I think if we played Spain in the round of 16, we would have got played off the park and lost and gone home. Um, so yeah, we've had really fortunate runs, but we haven't won anything. So it is a case of what could have been. You know, cheers to Gareth the, for some great nights at the pub and stuff. Um, but we haven't won anything. So it's time for something different now. And that isn't like a thing to say. Criticism. We all know Southgate isn't as good as almost every Premier League coach tactically, I'd probably say. Mm. I don't think I can think of many that aren't. He's probably the worst. Yeah, I don't. And that is the truth. He's a manager that had no experience really prior to that in at, at the top level he obviously had the 21s um but what he has done is unified the nation reunified the players together he's done that fantastically no one could have done that better but yeah we need to win something now i'm kind of you know i'm all for again throwing points and uh in the bar and stuff but I want to win something it's kind of it's beyond that point now for me like we've had a taste of Great memories and stuff, yeah, fantastic. But we'll have great memories again from the 20 years. But if we don't win anything, you know, mm, I'm not one for throwing pods, John. None of that nonsense. I, I don't drink, but it's um, you just get soaked, mate. Yesterday was uh, yeah. I saw a video of a guy, I can't remember what goal it was, it was in this tournament, and like they was, so you can see him on the big screen, and it goes in, he's holding it, and it just goes like that. It's like when it yeah, first yeah. happened a few yeah. years ago, it was like a like, what, it's still mental, but it's a spontaneity thing. Like it's happened. Oh my yeah. god, I can't believe it! Whoa, I've gone mental. Like yeah. that's fine. When you're literally like, standing there waiting to throw it for like an equalising penalty or something, it's insane. Like I do not understand that at all. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm not all for that, but I'm more for change. I'm more for actually winning something. Okay, right. That's the end of the show, John. Thank you for joining me as always. Uh, I've changed my background and my setup. By the way, I'm using my proper camera now, which hopefully looks better. This shirt. Behind me here is a sign shirt that I was gifted by some marketing agency that sent it to me from last year. I don't know why I'm um, trying to look over your shoulder when it's a video. <laughs> as if I've got, yeah, as yeah, if you can see around me. Uh, there it is. Uh, I've got a new print as well. I've worked on my background. I'm thinking of painting in here, by the way, John. Painting the wall. Would you like to help me pick the colour? I think it looks nice now. I quite like it. Like it. If in the comments you want to be. Uh, Idiot of the week, or whatever it was, we said. If you want to slag us off, and, and, uh, none of our viewers are idiots. Then come on, bad no, take. But I mean, if somebody says something silly, I'll say you're an idiot, mate. Some of them are idiots, by the way. Some of the ones I have to delete and don't get appeared because they're like really, really nasty. They're Me idiots. Too. The rest of them, lovely, lovely people. And if you've got criticism and critiques for the, ch to the for the channel, that's fine. If it's just like, oh. John John does a weird thing with his mouth when he talks. Like, no, 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 no. We're not allowed to say things like that because he can't help that. I can't help it. I've got a big nose or something. It's just, it is what it is, okay? So if you want to say something about the podcast from a critical point of view, that's fine. Uh, if you want to be a uh, bad take of the week, leave your comments down below. Why am I, why am I opening up, up, us up for criticism? I don't know. If you want to help choose the paint colour in my office, leave a comment down below. Uh, John, thanks for joining me as always. Thanks everyone for watching or listening to the Carton Blue podcast. And we'll see you on the next one.